What's up guys and gals? Welcome back to the Nerd Castle. My name is Splattercat. Happy to have you here today as we hang out. We play a little bit more Sunless Skies. I like this game a lot. This game is kind of like a top-down freelancer, and I've always been a big sucker for sandboxy 4X-ish narrative-related games, and they don't get made that often. That's the sad part, is they just don't get made. And so I actually I think that's the niche that Sunless Seas and Sunless Skies kind of filled in along with like Rogue Galaxy and games like that where it's a game that you can play it however you want. There's no right way or wrong way to play it. And then they also feed up like a really strong narrative along the way. And so I'm really enjoying myself with this series. I'm thinking it's gonna it's gonna be a long term so now that the long dark is over due to poor discretion. I'm thinking this is going to be the thing that's filling in the channel like every two or three days. I'll give you like 30 minutes of Sunless Skies. And we'll just keep it going so that you have a longer series here on the channel. So if you guys are down with that, let me know in the comments. Let me know how you feel about that. Let me know on stream. Come out to Twitch TV slash Plattercat Gaming. Hang out. Give me your thoughts. I'd love to hear them. Uh, so anyways, we need to go up to Titania, which is to the northeast in this playthrough. Five sacks of seeds to the northeast. I'm going to take these two. So we've got a five barrels of ours need to go down to the circus, which is to the southwest. We've got Port Prosper needs a couple of crates of souls. Okay. I mean, I find that it's good to have all four of your consignment slots, slots filled, like, at all times. So that if you see things around, you'd be like, oh, yeah, I need that for something. And then you kind of just work on the narratives that are in that direction while you play. I also find it easier in this game to focus on one storyline at a time and just chase that down. Like, it's not super cash efficient, but it's just easier to focus on, in all honesty. Like, this game has so much going on, and there's so many challenges and so many things that you can be working on. Like, I think in my playthrough, where I'm, like, 20, 30 hours into the first map... I've got probably around 15 quests. I've completed about 20 or so. And it's just your quest log is so full of things to work on that I tend to, like, pick an area of the map where the majority of the things are happening. Like, you know, the Northwest. So, like, Magdalene's Port Prosper and, like, the Nature Reserve. And any quests that share those as, like, common stop points, I just work on those kind of doggedly, just going in circles, occasionally coming back to drop off my port reports. I don't know. I find that it makes sense. It's easy to get overwhelmed with a game like this where there's a lot of things going on. And it is a narrative-heavy game where there's a lot of, like, subplots going on at any given time. And so I kind of find that, like, ignoring a lot of the plots, since they're not on a time limit anyways, and just working on one or two at a time is the best way for me to appreciate it, since, you know, my I got brain buzz really, really bad. I have trouble focusing on a lot of things at once. If you give me, like, one thing to focus on, I'll complete it like a scalpel with precision, and it'll be high quality. But, like, if you give me, like, a bunch of things to work on at once, I'm going to mess them all up simultaneously. It's just the way my brain works. Uh, we got to drop off our port reports over here. And so we've already talked to the prudent secretary. We should have a couple of port reports ready to go. There you go. So we got 200 more sovereigns. That should keep us in the sky a little bit longer. Taking a look at the quests and the things that we have to work on, there's a lot of them. There's a bunch of stuff around here that we kind of need to throw our backs into. So, actually, there's not that much. I'm, I thought it was worse than it was. So what I'm going to do is we're going to fly around and look for new locations. I think the Titania location is a really good idea. We can make some money over there. That'll also get us introduced. Uh, they say that it's the northeast. So let's go on a little adventure, shall we? Let's get flying in our space locomotive, as strange as that sounds. Let's go. Uh, if we see any Tackities along the way, we have pledged our allegiance to the Queen. And so we'll want to kill them off. There's one right there. But what I like to do is I would scout for a second because sometimes they have homies around. Like, sometimes there's, like, two or three of them. And, like, whereas we can handle one of these guys, two or three of them at once is probably going to be too much for us to handle. So, like, even with good dodging, this game gets really sketchy once there's, like, three enemies on screen. All right, so he's going to fire back right there. We're going to wait for his next shot. And we're just going to kind of dodge that. I'm going to start putting some rounds, like, in his direction. Oh, he stopped. Okay. Clever girl. Oh, he almost got me right there. He tried to match my vector. Gotcha. You got to watch out for that. When the AI, like, dodges at the same time as you dodge in the same direction, they're always trying to line up a follow-up shot. And so, like, you should just memorize that pattern so that you know to juke back the other direction after, like, X amount of time when they do it. Because they do like to do that a lot. I Oh, I thought I was going to eat that one. 
Yep, flick that one out at him. And then he's kind of hurting right now. Did I get him? Ah, missed. Little short. Little short on that one. I'm going to get him, though. I need that Tackety nameplate. We get paid 25 sovereigns per nameplate. And frankly, there are Tackety's everywhere in this game to kill. And so, like, stacking those up just while you're around and in the neighborhood is a really good plan to keep yourself with, like, a little sideline amount of income coming in. And they drop loot as well. And so we can pillage their store for fuels or supplies. Or we could take the cargo. I'm going to take the cargo. What do we have? We have two sacks of verdant seeds. We needed those. Hell yeah, dude. All right. That's what I'm talking about. But yeah, we, we actually picked up the seeds that we needed. So that's kind of crazy. We got to go to the northeast now, though. And we got to find where Titania is. Uh, Titania, kind of an interesting place. I think you guys are going to like it, but... Part of this game is the journey. It's not necessarily the destination. Like, it's all the things that happen before you get to the destination along the way. And so I got a feeling we're going to have some good events today. We got a lighthouse over there. I think there's a way to the northeast over here. What is that? Treasure? Hold on. Who said there was treasure down here? Ooh, there is. There's flotsam. Yeah, let's get it. Let's grab it. Okay. Oh, there's a bad guy. I'm going to flick a shot at him, but yeah, these guys are kind of like upgraded versions of the normal Marauders. You'll kind of want to keep an eye on them. So they've got shotguns, like those right there. Much more difficult to dodge, much more likely that you're going to take some damage. Uh, they also have a charge attack that they'll fire off every now and again. And so if you've noticed, I've put my back to the wall right here. And what's going to happen is if he tries to get me with that charge attack, he's going to endo into the wall. And there it is right there. Unfortunately, I had to reposition because I wasn't trying to eat shotgun right now. But we may have to back off. Now, each pellet of the shotgun does not do that much damage. But it does enough to be considered. Yeah, let's... Oh, I'm overheated. That's really, really bad. Okay, so my maneuverability is going to be a little bit lower for a second. I'm going to try and get up on this wall right here. I don't know how interested in fighting us he is. But... Oh, he stayed out of the way of that one. Yep. Damn. Get back over here. Get back over here. He's trying to line up for a charge. If I eat a shotgun, that's okay. I'd like to finish him, though, before he, like, shreds all of our armor. The crew of the Weathered Engine have been driven mad by the wind and the stars and the things that haunt the sky. Uh, let's go ahead and we'll loot the hold. I don't think we need an intriguingly bulging sack. How pleasingly it rattles. A stoppered vial falls out of the sack after sufficient shaking. A collection of gathered disappointments that someone might be willing to pay for. So these are low-quality souls. There are also high-quality souls, if you didn't know about that. Now, the high-quality souls, that sucks. We could have had room for that if that fight had gone on a little bit longer because we were about to roll over our fuel and our supplies. Lame. We had to jettison something, like, legitimately five seconds before we would have had room. Oh, well. Uh, those are low-quality souls. So souls in the world of sunless skies and sunless seas are of varying qualities. Like people that were, like, church-going and had lots of friends and were loved by many are, like, really, really valuable souls. Uh, the souls of criminals, the tarnished, people that did bad things that are against, you know, good nature or against religion or whatever else. I don't even know if you could say religion. Because, like, there are, like, there is, like, Christianity in this universe, but it's, like, different. It's, like, morphed. And so anyways, basically bad people have shitty souls that no one wants to pay a lot of money for. And if you're a good, upstanding person that everybody loves and everybody admires, then your soul is worth like a fortune if you sell it. And so you can find differing grades of souls that will sell for different amounts. Those are crappy souls right there. We got the souls that you would probably be able to harvest off of the, like, floor mat of like a 2002 Kia Sentra. Like, they're not great souls. They're, they're like, eh, they're, they're rough souls. They're, they're a little bit unshaven. Let's go ahead and send the bat out and see if we find anything over here. I'm trying to... What do we have? Hey, we found it! All right! I wandered right into it. Nice. Like, sometimes it takes me for, like, even with my experience in the game now, having played, like, a lot, like, sometimes it takes me a while to find locations. Like, it seems sometimes it feels like your bat finds everything but the port that's in the middle of all the other stuff. You're just like, please find the... Please. Please just find the port. All I want from you is to find the port. I don't know if this is actually Titania. It's looking a little snowy over here for Titania. Yeah, it's Carillon. Okay. You can tell from the checkerboard floors. So, 
That means it's either over here. Did it say... Did it say which way it was favoring? It said north, northeast. Oh, so it's more to the north. Okay. So I'm kind of looking direct 45 degrees right now. And instead, it's probably like right here. I misread it. Oh, well, we made it all the way out here. So we might as well gather a port report and see what storylines are available in Carillon, the place where devils dwell. Let's spin around inside. The Garden of Insatiable Roses. What are roses insatiable for? I would assume like sunlight. Like light rainfalls, dustings of water. I don't know. Oh, we leveled up. Nice. The peaceful Carmine Institution was founded by devils from London and dedicated to the betterment of the soul. Botheridge's A Tour of Heaven describes it as a cross between a spa, a sanatorium, and purgatory. She commends its bracing airs. Now let's go to the shop real fast first and see what they have on sale. They have bronze wood. We do need bronze wood. Uh, they also have chorister nectar. We need bronze wood for the quest that we're currently performing out in Port Prosper. We also need chorister nectar. So, like, we could technically get both of the things for that quest right now if we were so inclined. It's an option. Let's take a look at our story make sure we're not going to pick anything up. Gray stone, the color of a monastery, attending devils and devilesses dressing in uniform, and an incoming parade of the sick, the friendless, the dying, and those who think their lives would be better if they were something else. This is Carillon, where souls are refined into something more impressive. Uh, we'll get our port report. And so you take some notes on a pilgrim's journey through Carillon. The first port of call is the beehive-shaped office in the center, or more accurately, the long queue that leads into it. From there, the infernal attendants direct them to one of Carillon's seven gardens to undergo penances. They certainly look penitent by the time that they emerge. Presumably their souls are much improved. Not that you can tell. So, like, devils are kind of a curious case in the world of sunless seas and sunless skies and fallen London. Like, devils are going to come across like they really want to help humanity, and they really want to just, like, assist you with whatever your problems are. They're going to seem very kind, very beautiful, very amicable, very friendly, but at the end of the day, all they really want is your soul. They've just found that being nice is the best way to get your soul into their possession. So never trust the devil. You know how in Shadowrun you never make a deal with a, with a dragon? Well, in Fallen London, you never make a deal with a devil. It's never going to work out. Uh, let's go ahead and talk to the presiding devilish. She's an artisan of souls. Perhaps she can do something with yours. Maybe she'll just give you advice. The presiding devilish works in an office that's shaped like a beehive, a stone and wickerwork building that stands all alone in the middle of Carillon's central courtyard. She conducts intake interviews with new patients one by one. After a long time in line, you reach it her at last. Greetings, Captain. How can we stretch, strain, purify, and strengthen you, now that you've come to Carillon? Her apron is starched. Her dress is pinstriped. There is a stack of patient files on her desk that are color-coded. Color the corners of her mouth say she knows something to your disadvantage. Uh, we can purchase an indulgence because we have souls. Why not? I've never done that before. I want to see what happens. She copies out the writ of indulgence on calfskin and daubs its corners with oil. Afterwards, she attaches her own signature in the seal of presiding authority of Carillon. It's not quite the same as penance served yourself, she admits, but it can be used in some situations. If it does not meet with your requirements, then simply remember that you should not have been allowed to buy it in the first place. I don't know what that does, but I don't need the souls right now. We're not going back to Port Prosper for a little bit. So, we've got some penances. I don't know what I use those for. It looks like we have them right there, and then I need an inescapable truth. I need an ordeal penance. I need a penance of excess, enlightenment, and then I can provide exquisite insight. And apparently something really, really good happens. Chances are it's going to give us a searing enigma. Now, that tends to be the go-to reward in Sunless Skies and the Sunless Sea for most of the big quests that take you a while to chase down. In both games, Searing Enigmas are pretty useful. They're all right. Extraordinary Implications are pretty good. But uh, there's a big one at the top that's called a something rather truth. It starts with D. I forget what it is. But anyways, there's only like one or two of those in the entire game, unless you trade for them with really, really expensive stuff. And those, a dire, impl is it a dire, is dire portent? A dire, it's something. But basically, it's a fundamental truth of the universe, and it's one of the rarest pieces of loot in Sunless Seas. I don't know if it's in this game. I haven't found one yet. I found a bunch of Searing Enigmas so far playing Sunless Skies, but I haven't found that one. The, the top tier of secret that you can find out. 
Uh, what about Carillon? We do whatever's necessary to reclaim unsatisfactory souls, she says. She sits back in her chair and you can imagine her making such a pitch to the princes of hell. For humans primarily, though, we do attend to a few other creatures, somewhere or elsewhere on the Great Chain. They come to us with souls that are stained, disused, in every kind of sordid condition, and we make them acceptable again. Most of those who come to us are volunteers. The rest are beyond the position of being able to volunteer and have been consigned to Carillon by their families and or their employers. Okay. So, we can stay here. What happens when they stay? Most people go home again, she says. Some find that they're weary of their souls and they'll pass them on to us. We operate on a slender profit from those souls and on what we can get from donations or from sales of penance and forgiveness. She looks at the blank page in front of her. But what about you? You look sturdy enough to make full use of our services. Are you afraid of needles? What's your view on worms? Which do you fear more, venoms or poisons? She takes down a page or two on all your least favorite things. Okay. Well, we don't really have anything else that we can do over here. So, we can visit an isolated office, but we need five affiliation with the establishment, and that's going to be kind of hard to pull up. As we level up, we will gain association with different networks, i.e. criminals, the government, the establishment, the military, stuff like that. And those associations are going to help you access storylines in different areas. And so it would be entirely possible, for example, that this one right here takes five establishment. You can get one when you start. You can get one from having a couple different people in your party. And then you can get two or three from leveling up. But that represents a significant amount of time that you've spent ingratiating yourself to the establishment. And it leaves me wondering if you're going to be able to do every storyline in one playthrough or if you've got to pick and choose the few allies you want to have each time that you play the game. I suppose that's a question for another time. I'm going to grab all three of those because they're going to sell for a tidy profit. Oh, we're actually out of money. Ass. I needed a chorister nectar. Oh, well. Oh, well, we'll have to pick one up elsewhere. We'll sell two of those woods when we get back to New Winchester. And then from there, we'll pick up a chorister nectar somewhere else. They're not actually that hard to come by. So, in our storyline, we started out as a revolutionary where we got scarred in a fight. We had a brush with death while being a revolutionary. After that, we went briefly insane, and we had to go to a sanatorium because the wound was apparently too painful or the memories of the revolution failing were too great. So now what happened to us after we got out of the sanitarium? Uh, we can do Liberation of the Night. Apparently we can join a secret anarchist cell. That definitely sounds like a revolutionary, something that we would do. Uh, we can get a mentor who looks kindly upon us after we get out of the sanatorium and decides to bring us up. Uh, we can live on the smoggy streets. This is actually our youth. But anyways, I tend to look at these sequentially because I, I find that it tells the story about our character better if I read through it sequentially. And every single time, depending on what you pick, I've noticed my stories develop differently. On one of my playthroughs, I'm like a hardcore criminal. I've done time in prison. I've got a scar from a fight. I fell in love but lost that love. And then my criminality, like, amplified, you know what I mean? And I started doing worse and worse things. Uh, I find that it's different each time. I say that what's logical right now is that we would be haunted. You are plagued by the past, so maybe something happened during our battle as a revolutionary that we regret or that we feel that we did poorly. Uh, we get a free tale of terror when we do this. Our stats right now, we're really hurting for hearts, and so I think it wouldn't be the worst idea for us to bring our hearts up slightly. And so you are plagued by the past, by some guilt or sin or ordeal that will not let you rest. What is the nature of your presence? A ghostly haunting, or we can have a nightmarish visitation. When we sleep, we just we can't sleep. We have insomnia. Or we can actually be physically haunted by a ghost. I like both ideas, but I think this one makes more sense given the fact that we were a revolutionary caught up in, you know, fighting and wars and everything else. And so we're now haunted. Let's see if we can find Titania up and around to the northeast before we run out of supplies and die horribly. In fact, it may be a better idea to stop back off at Winchester and resupply before we do this. Because we don't have any money right now. We don't have any pocket change. That's what I'm going to do. I've actually changed my mind. We're going to go look for Titania. I was thinking about it. We're going to sell those seeds when we get there. And that will give us the pocket change that we need in order to resupply once we arrive. And so we don't really need to go back to New Winchester right now. That would be a long trip and a waste of supplies for 
not too great a profit, in all honesty. I'm going to sell, like... I'm going to sell two things of wood when I get down there, which is going to give us, like, 350. 400 Echoes or Sovereigns or whatever they want to call them this time around. I'm going to keep sending out the back because we need to... This looks right. This looks right. I see the vines. I think this is what we're looking for. Is that it right there? Sometimes it does a little tiny icon instead of a big icon, and I don't know why. I think it's a bug. I think it's an issue where sometimes the icon is so little you can't see it, but if you zoom out and zoom back in, it'll resize itself. Ah, we hear chorister bees up in here. If we could kill some chorister bees, we could get that honey that we need to complete that quest over in Port Prosper. And then I can super regret using up all of my souls because I said we weren't going back over there. But obviously, if we complete the quest, we're going to beeline straight over that way because there's profit in it. Uh, don't hit the edge of that flower right there. It'll deal damage to your craft. We'll pull on in, and welcome to the giant flower. Titania is cupped in the petals of a colossal orchid, heady with scent and lurid with color. An enclave of bohemians have made it their home, seeking inspiration in the wildness of the reach. If you don't know what a bohemian is, don't feel too bad about it. I didn't know what a bohemian was either until I played this game. A bohemian is like an artist. Somebody on, like, the fringes of society, a roustabout, like, somebody that's kind of like the definition of the starving artist um, that, like, sees themselves very, very highly, sort of pretentious, I think, is also kind of associated with Bohemia. Um, so let's go to the shops first, and we'll drop this off. So we got five of those. That's 400 bucks we just picked up. We got $100 as a bonus. A florid landscapist is planning a modest floral garden in Titania. That should do it, the florid landscapist declares. She stores the stacks carefully away from any sources of water, because the flora of the Reach are dangerously ebullient when nourished. Ebullient? I don't know how to say that word. I learn a lot of new vocabulary when I play these games. Please accept this as traditional or as additional compensation. Nice. Oh, they've got hours over here. Don't we have a quest to drop off hours somewhere? Yeah, at the circus. There's profit in that for us. Let's go do it. We're also going to use a little bit. Oh, we can pick up the Chorister Nectar here. I'm not against it. I think I'm going to do it. It's going to cut into our profits a little bit. But I find that to be acceptable. All right. So we're on the road. We have tasks to undertake. Uh, let's go back to Valentine Square real fast. And we will go to Oberon's Landing. We'll get our port report done. What is Titania? It's a question without an easy answer. To poets, it's a place of inspiration. To stone workers, an untouched slab. To the playwrights, it's a blank page, a place of tranquility, creation, and your interviewee pauses, looking suddenly worried. Do you hear that buzzing? Uh, I need to go inside. The port unfurls itself and welcomes you ashore. This perfumed haven was intended for thinkers, artists, philosophers, poets. Instead, you enter its main dome to find yourself surrounded by arguing bohemians and the unfinished shells of buildings in a variety of styles. Nobody looks happy. But at least everyone agrees that it's somebody else's fault. Oh, we can explore. Why not? Light sparkles through the jeweled petals onto the marble white paths. Wherever you explore, poets and singers perform their latest work, while artists peer behind canvases to try to capture the beauty in oil and chalk. In the horrors of the high wilderness, this is a place of safety and wonder where nothing could possibly disturb the peace. But uh, what's that buzzing in the distance? All right. Titania's petals fill the air with a perpetual perfume, but eventually you become accustomed to it. Even so, the scent of so many flowers in the mayor's small office sends your senses reeling. Obviously unaffected, she sits behind her desk and gestures for you to take the other chair. Is there any work here? The rhapsodic mayor shakes her head. I think you'll find us most self-sufficient, Captain. Enjoy your visit and take in some poetry. If I think of anything that we might require, you'll be the first to know. Okay. What's it like out here in Titania? Spectacular place, isn't it? We couldn't believe that nobody else had colonized it after, well, whoever built all the crystal domes and spires. Honestly, I couldn't really believe our luck. Yeah, this sounds like a recipe for heartache. I'm pretty sure something bad's gonna happen here. Let's continue back to New Winchester, shall we? Eh, we got a little event over here. There's a little bit of combat, too. I killed a raider, too. No big deal. It was easy peasy. But we actually have a bunch of settlers over here. Let's see what they want. Settlers who live so far beyond the edge of... We've already read this. Uh, this place is warm and welcoming in the wide night. We can trade them a sky story and they'll give us supplies. We can leave swiftly. That'll lower our terror. We can give them munitions so they can protect themselves and they'll trade us bronzewood for, bronze for that. That's a really good trade. If you, get the if you get the munitions for free from, like, loot or if you get them from, like, a sale at a bazaar, 
Uh, you can turn 30 sovereigns into 175 sovereigns real quick, so don't overlook that right there. Uh, let's go ahead and we'll go ahead and reduce our tear by eating our fill. You enjoy a meal of sticky porridge and viney vegetables. Afterwards, you and your host exchange noncommittal observations on the war between the stovepipes and the tackities. Your crew are content for a time. One of them even speculates idly about settling down. Yeah, don't do that. I need crew on this ship. I need people, like, manning the hatches over here. Otherwise, it's not going to work out for us. In a lot of ways, this is a hard game to film. Much like Sunless Sea. Because so much of the time is just spent in isolation. Kind of floating around the galaxy, basically. And I think that's part of the atmosphere of the game. Is that you really do kind of feel alone. And Sunless Sea was also very good at that. Where it felt like you were just kind of traveling randomly, you know. But... It's, it's kind of strange because like you want to cut it out a lot of the time with a YouTube video But at the same time it's such a large part of the gameplay experience that you want to showcase that for people too That like there is a lot of travel time in this game. There is no fast travel But while you're traveling around there is plenty to think about like what quests you want to do What things you should be working on at the given moment what dangers are waiting for you the random events that pop up And so I, I think it's a good thing. I think they strike a really good balance in between like Let's go ahead and unload on this tackity real quick. Like, I'm not proud of it, but I want his stuff. Oof, almost went right into that one. Almost. You know, I'm like killing him right outside the city walls right now. Ooh, right into that one, though. And it's a hit. Sniped him out. It took a little bit of damage right there. I may use this guy to repair my hull if I have the option. Now we can seize the cargo or we can scrap it. The cargo could be valuable and it could pay for the repairs. Right now our repairs are going to run us roughly like maybe 20 sovereigns. I feel like we have a lot more to gain by seizing the cargo. Yeah, we do. We got a barrel of unseasoned hours. Those are worth 80, so that'll pay for the repairs and we'll have a little bonus. And since we're so close to town, it's not really too hard of a decision. One thing you also want to notice is that these places over here, they also have their own bazaar. I forgot to talk about that in the last episode, but the company house and the tackety place, they both have a bazaar inside of them, in case you didn't know. And you can use this to make some quick profits really, really easily, so make sure you're checking these. I don't think a lot of people notice that these have a bazaar attached to them. Uh, let's turn in our port reports. And so there it is. We've got 200 more bucks. Sounds good. And then in the bazaar, we don't really have room. I'll buy one because we can flip those for like 15 bucks. We'll check and see what's in the bazaar at this place too for some fast profit. Because you can legitimately grab things from these two spots and take it back to New Winchester and make like 300, 400 sovereigns if you're lucky. So keep that in mind as well. Easy peasy money. Uh, you should be stacking money pretty quickly in this game once you get moving and you start getting to the middle or the end of a lot of the quest lines. You should start getting little bundles of 500 sovereigns at a time that allow you to upgrade to the next train or add more gear to this train if you wanted to just kit this one out and customize it. It's all your call, whatever you want to do. But here at this bazaar, there's nothing available. At the Victoria Market, I can sell how many seasons... How many of those did I need? I needed five. So we're going to keep these right here. We're going to sell off two of the Chorister Nectars. We're going to sell off the Verdant Seeds, and that's 390 right there. We're up to 700. When we drop this off, we've got a pretty solid payday coming. These right here are going to... We're going to have a lot of money once we drop these off, especially if we can buy some more of them, but I don't think that's going to be the option right now. Let me repair our craft, and then I think that's going to be all that we have time for right now. My name is Splattercat. Thank you for joining me for another episode of Sunless Skies. I'll see you all later. Get the game down below if it looks interesting to you. Hi, do, and I'll see you next time, everybody.